Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to The Accelerator with Michael Conniff. That's me. We are the home for entrepreneurs, startups, founders, and also angels, VCs, family offices, and investment firms. So it's great to be here. Um, remember to uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or any of the other major platforms. And remember to follow me on Twitter at Michael Conniff, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-O-N-N-I-F-F. I am very happy and very curious today to be joined by another Michael, Michael Pasco. He's the head of uh, Satoshi's Wallet, a crypto company. How are you, Michael? And welcome to The Accelerator. I'm good. Thank you, Michael, for having me. Satoshi's Closet, actually, the wallet is the name of one of our apps that we're working on. So you would think I, I understand I would the up, You would think I would screw up Satoshi and not the closet. Anyway, Satoshi's Closet which is a very interesting name. So you, you, you have to start with the name on this one because why, so tell people who Satoshi sure. is and why Satoshi's Closet. Sure. So Satoshi is short for Satoshi Nakamoto, which is the pseudonym for the creator or creators of Bitcoin back in 2008, 2009. And there's some suspicion around who Satoshi may have actually been um, in real life, um, but but Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto, really at, at the spirit of Bitcoin culture and crypto culture, we found to be uh, a fitting name or part of our name, um, and, and I believe part of the power of Bitcoin and crypto's emergence over the last decade stems from that being a pseudonym. There's there's a figurehead, if you will, but there's not an individual with a known identity that we can criticize or dig into mm -hmm. politics or anything. So there's a mystique about it that I think is special. Isn't and it, how, how I entered the space. We don't we don't even know who he is to this day. So so that's amazing. Yeah. How did you enter how did you come that's to be right. here? Yeah, yeah, great question. And and the second part of the name, the closet part, right? So Satoshi's closet uh, was the name we came up with when we started uh, my partner and I in 2019 as the first to put physical apparel onto blockchain using mm -hmm. NFTs, which at the time, NFT was not a common part of the parlance whatsoever in the space. Mm -hmm. But I've been a digital product designer for over a decade. I've worked in technology for that time. So the emergence of crypto is something that I was always keenly aware of and initially learned about use cases for NFTs around supply chain and mm. attaching these digital identifiers to physical goods. So that combined with the observations I was making living here in New York around physical goods in the apparel space, luxury goods, streetwear, sneakers, limited edition items with secondary markets, that seemed like a natural marriage with this new NFT technology. So we came up with the idea to actually put physical apparel on blockchain via NFTs. And now we see companies like Gucci, Nike, Adidas, and others breaking into the space with these same ideas. What did you put on the blockchain initially as the person pioneering this stuff? Yeah, so we, we, called, uh, we called our release of 50 t-shirts the initial shirt offering which was an homage to the initial coin offerings, the ICOs of the day. And this was a graphic tee with a giant QR code emblazoned on the back. The medium is the message. And embedded in that QR code is the smart contract address for the NFT. So if you scan that with a phone, it will take you to a landing page actually on our site where you could learn more about the provenance of the piece as well as seeing uh, digital artwork complement to the physical t-shirt so let's take a step even even further back um so um being in the um, crypto space um nfts are non-fungible tokens we want everybody to know that um that are uh you can you can rephrase this if you'd like but that are connected to the blockchain and as such are subject to a smart so-called smart contract that determines the uh, the usage and and sort of the, the the life moving forward of this this digital asset is that is that a good way to put it? That's a great description, actually. And why that's so powerful is in the pre NFT age, 
digital assets were hard to own. If an artist was to create an artwork and export it as a JPEG or a musician to create an MP3, once that file was created and distributed through the world, it was just out there in an ocean of digital files. You couldn't really own or contain it in any meaningful way. And with NFTs, though that file, that MP3 could still be globally accessible, now the artist, the creator can imbue uh, a sense of ownership over a specific one or quantity of those digital assets, much like you may have a print of the Mona Lisa or a Picasso, but you don't own the original as deemed the one true work by its creator. You own the NFT. Now, um, what what has changed now that the uh, stock market has declined, now that the price of, uh, you know, Coinbase and crypto stocks, this is not a good time, right? A big, a big chunk of the market has disappeared, the value of the market. So my question to you as an entrepreneur in the space is, has that changed anything for you? It's challenging. Being an entrepreneur is challenging by nature, as you and your audience know. There are benefits to a hype cycle being washed away, where the real builders and uh, the resilient among us uh, are able to separate from those that were only here for the hype cycle. And though Mm -hmm. I just barely missed the dot-com boom uh, with my age and participation in the world of entrepreneurship, I think it's probably a good parallel to look at the dot-com bubble burst where we saw Amazon and other companies trading for a fraction of their previous highs and they took years to recover and their new highs make the previous highs look paltry by comparison. And I think that's where we're headed with this industry overall. And uh, that doesn't take away some of the short term pain, um, at least uh, as, as an individual participant in the market. Um, there's some pain involved, but as a builder in the space, I think ultimately it can help us stand out from those that weren't really here to build for the long term. So let's talk about what's in Satoshi's closet and um, we'll go back to the wallet. The wallet is an important piece. So let's start there. What, what, what is a, uh, a wallet in, the, in this context and why is it important and why do people need one? Great question. A wallet is arguably the most important component in the entire crypto economy. And when I'm referring to a wallet, what I really mean is a self custodial wallet. There's a saying in crypto, I not actually, your key. I actually don't know what that crypto. means. What is a self, well, pardon me, but I don't know what that means. What is a self custodial wallet? Yeah. Uh, Great question. So uh, a self-custodial wallet in in many ways is like your physical wallet in which the cash and credit cards and things, your NFTs, like your family photos, maybe your membership card in your wallet are truly in your possession. That $20 bill in your wallet is a bearer asset. And you can hand that to somebody at the market, at the gas station and get goods and services for that money. On the other hand, the money that you or I have in a bank account is actually in the bank's custody. Chase has your money. Wells Fargo has your money. Mm -hmm. And there are ramifications there around your access to it and the government's access to it, the bank's access to it. They could cut off your access for uh, a number of reasons. Um, Even if you're swept up into things as, as a good actor within the space or think about how it may take multiple days to withdraw funds. Mm -hmm. or transfer from one of your accounts to another. Why should it take you three days to get your money? That's your money. With a self-custodial wallet, you are your own bank. You possess your own assets, and that has a lot of advantages. It also has some challenges. It's a different model. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a lot of responsibility if you hold a lot of wealth within a self-custodial world. So there are other ramifications and layers of the onion that we could peel back. But by having this self-custodial model, you you really are your own bank. You are a self-sovereign financial individual to go and transact out in the crypto economy. 
and to participate in spaces like DeFi or decentralized finance and the NFT economy, that is done almost entirely today through this self-custodial model. Mm -hmm. So you also have um, NFT, an NFT gallery and an NFT minting capability. Let's let's do this in reverse order. Um, People, many people have heard of NFT minting without actually knowing what it is. How would how would you describe it? Minting an NFT is is a fancy word for saying creating an NFT. Making an uh, NFT. I don't know where the term mint came in. I guess tokens, right? Tokens get minted at a treasury. I like the terminology, actually. I even like the term NFT, although maybe not everybody does. I think it's great. Um, so one creates a smart contract on a blockchain. And to even rewind there a tiny bit, outside of Bitcoin, which is pretty purely a cryptocurrency, a store of value, a medium of exchange, Mm -hmm. blockchains like Ethereum, Tezos, Solana, and others are also basically programmable. They have their own programming language. So now you're melding the worlds of software and money. And since software and money are already so entangled in our world, it makes sense for from the through the lens of building and, and connecting these services to have them running on rails that are one and the same. Mm-hmm. So to create a smart contract is basically creating an application that runs on the blockchain that can interact with user inputs in kind of a traditional software sense, as well as cryptocurrency and tokens being linked into that application. So one can create a smart contract that can mint or create these NFTs based on certain parameters that one puts in the code. I'm putting you in a position of of explaining some basics. So um, cryptocurrency as as a great example and tokens. Okay. So Cryptocurrency, um, how would you describe it? Cryptocurrency is, is money. It, but it's and not, and it's NFTs not, or, or crypto assets are what you buy with that money. Crypto assets are what you buy with, with uh, cryptocurrency. Correct. That seems a little circular. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could probably consider cryptocurrency itself like a crypto so money asset. Is, but... Money is what you buy with money. <laughs> you know, I'm a well, little... no, you're, you're using your magical internet money to buy your magical internet pictures, which are the okay. NFTs. That's to me, it actually makes a lot of sense where in, in this pre-NFT world, we had cryptocurrency, which mm-hmm. is which is money. I call it money, at least to the extent that somebody's willing to accept that currency in exchange for goods and services, it is money. And now that we have NFTs, which really is an umbrella term that right now it's, it's a lot of crypto art and digital collectibles. It will grow into areas like tickets, deeds, certificates of ownership for physical and other digital products, financial instruments. Um, Now, Again, because we're, we're transacting on these crypto economic rails, it makes sense to use cryptocurrency to buy a different sort of crypto product on the other end of that, which right now is largely encapsulated by this NFT world. And how about tokens? How would you describe them? I, I don't know if there's a really great definition or distinction between coins and tokens. I think token is quite an umbrella term. Um, You know, cryptocurrency is a fungible token. NFT standing for non-fungible tokens. Fungible. They're all kind of, it's like a unit. I'm sorry. It's basically a unit that exists on a blockchain. It's like this digital entry within a record. um, And that, that, could manifest as that token being a currency and with it being fungible, again, going back to our cash example, our, our US dollars are fungible. The $20 bill in my pocket is really no different than the $20 bill in your pocket. Yeah, they have different serial numbers, but they're completely interchangeable. I hope it doesn't leave your pocket as quickly as it leaves my pocket, but 
you know, well, with inflation <laughs> and living in New York City, a twenty dollar bill yeah. is like a ten dollar bill elsewhere in the world. I think yeah. out here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but a token. Let me give you an example. So I'm I'm um, an advisor to something called Uniplat, the Unify platform. It's in Switzerland. It's bringing together developers uh, from, uh, pardon me, non-developed countries. Um, it's focused on innovators people de developing intellectual property, inventions, and those sorts of things. Now, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to issue, or they already have issued some tokens, kind of as like a reward. Um, people can get tokens uh, somehow. Um, there's a value to that. Um, and there's also a value, I think, from what I understand, to um, issuing them kind of as a marketing um, opportunity as a marketing uh, uh, method. So what do you think of that? Tell, tell us what you think of that. There are a lot of projects that bootstrap their liquidity and these sort of internal economies that they're creating by seeding the market with these tokens. Uh, the, the idea being that if you get the tokens into enough people's hands, you help legitimize the value of the token. Money, money is dependent on having network effects. If nobody will accept it, it doesn't really have much value. So the more they can distribute the tokens to a larger holder base, the greater hypothetical network effects there are for people to actually transact in that money. Um, most probably of, of these models that I've seen and you'll see some adjacent uh, programs or, you know, it's kind of marketing, you might say, around staking of coins or farming or mining of tokens where you get some tokens and then you lock them into a smart contract somewhere that will then feed more tokens back out to you with the idea that if you're locking them into place, then you can't just sell them all in the open market and crater the price of this token. Uh, it, it can be it can be a pretty delicate house of cards. Um, mm -hmm. I hate to delegitimize the, the concept and certainly not the industry, but uh, mm -hmm. you can create coins, you can mint them essentially out of thin air, and you may have legitimate values, ideals, and purposes, um, but you still need to build up a belief in this currency, in this token having value. And part of how that is attempted to be orchestrated is distributing it to people so that when that utility piece comes in and you can put those Chuck E. Cheese tokens into the skee ball machine and actually get some fun out of it, that it's established itself enough amongst a community and a market that when the skee ball machine is ready, people are ready to play. Hey, who's not ready for ski ball? Come on, let's get serious. Always, always. We are, we are talking to Michael Pasco. He's the head of, let me get it right, Satoshi's Closet. Uh, this is the accelerator with Michael Conniff. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, make sure to like us a lot, subscribe to us, but also give us a high rating whenever possible. That would that would be nice. Um, but let me let, let's talk about your company now. We talked a little more generally. So. Um, what are your ambitions for Satoshi's Closet and why did you create a crypto company, an NFT company like this? What, what was it about this that kind of got you excited? What we're doing is building apps, uh, services, technology to enable the NFT economy in real life in physical spaces like live events and venues. It's our vision that in only a few years time, you will go to a basketball game, maybe here at Madison Square Garden or a music festival or even a retail shop, an art gallery being a primary example. And you will see digital collectibles and artwork mm -hmm. being sold alongside physical goods like hats, t-shirts and other merch that application layer doesn't really exist yet. Last year, there were over $44 billion of NFT sales globally, and very little of that came through mobile 
and almost zero of it came from IRL exchange. Mm -hmm. And this is an experience that I've had personally in having created NFT artworks and holding a show to display and sell these artworks. And it turns out that it's easier to sell an NFT to somebody 6,000 miles away that is sitting at a computer and has a, a browser extension wallet installed than to sell an NFT to somebody six feet away who isn't already immersed in this crypto economy. I want so to point out to, a, a couple of things, just that there's a company called Legacy Leagues that is uh, scheduled to be on a podcast soon. They're a sports company, sports NFT company. They just signed a three-year deal with Clemson to pretty much do what you're mm. describing. Um, and there's also a company that we've had on the show called Vilti, which is in the ticketing and music space and um, has a really interesting, innovative model as to how to monetize this. And um, the good news for them is they're in a space ticketing that, though it has been disrupted once by SeatGeek and, and StubHub, is so ready to be disrupted again, <laughs> in my opinion, as a, as a music lover and, and a sports lover, sports goer. Um, so this, this kind of thing is not really theoretical anymore. It's actually, we're, we're starting to see it. Yeah, absolutely. We are. There was um, an app that debuted last week during NFT NYC called Token Proof. And they ended up being sort of the smash hit of the week. They were the preferred ticketing solution, the only ticketing solution for ApeFest, which is a big event that happened um, during NFT NYC, if you're familiar at all with Board Ape Yacht Club and that NFT project. And once right. they got that um, event to use token proof. Every other major project that had events last week adopted token proof. Um, they, so that the yeah, in, in, in the value particular. in the yacht club, haven't they fallen in value? Forgive me for interrupting. Haven't they fallen in value? Uh, they have, as well as everything else. They've probably been as price resilient as any uh, other asset in the market today. Okay, so so better than you might think. So what's the what's the near horizon for for Satoshi's closet? Um, are you hoping to be the ubiquitous? Well, there are a lot of wallets out there, so this might be a way to ask it. Like, what's unique? What's different? What's better about Satoshi's closet and your wallet? Yeah, so our wallet, which we call Wallet W L T, has been live on the App Store and Play Store now for about five weeks, and mm -hmm. Our wallet has a completely different design than any other mobile wallet on the market right now. Its usability is completely different. Its interface is completely different. And it really focuses on NFTs and artwork and artists and creators and is a multi-chain wallet. It's focused on what I would call basic use cases of crypto create a wallet, be able to send and receive cryptocurrency, buy and sell NFTs and view all of your NFTs on a multitude of blockchains. It doesn't have the deeper technical features or deeper DeFi integrations that are important in the space, but to a really small subset of the greater world. <laughs> to reach the next 100 million billion users of crypto, we need ease of usability, human-centered design, price-accessible blockchains, and it needs to be done on mobile. There's almost as many mobile devices on the planet as there are people. Not everybody's going to be sitting at their computer like this, uh, engaging in the crypto economy. If you want to go to the game, if you want to go to the music festival, if you have an NFT ticket, you want to buy an NFT collectible after the show, that all needs to be done on mobile. So our wallet is designed to be the one crypto wallet, the NFT wallet for mainstream users around the world. And, and, and that fits the, into our model response? of enabling <laughs> NFT. I'm what's sorry? Been the response? What's been the response so far? Uh, the general? response is great. Um, it's it's um, in some ways um, in this phase of where our, our product life cycle is, our challenge is that our product today is designed for part of that subset of the market of early adopters. 
while we're building out the functionality to bridge new people into the crypto economy so that our app will be able to take somebody from zero to one and understand crypto and be able to participate in it in a way that helps flatten what is otherwise a very steep learning curve. Mm. So the response has been very strong from people who are deeply engaged in this space, while really our target is uh, a quarter or so down the road when our product roadmap hits a stage where we can start bringing new people into the fold. And what's your ultimate hope for, for your company, Michael? Um, you're, you're still early stages. How, how, how long have you been in business? We've been in business, even that's kind of a tricky question, right? This started as a, as a side project, a passion project in 2019. That's when we put the first physical apparel on blockchain. Um, and I've been working in, in a couple of different roles uh, was in a couple of different roles through 2019, 2020, um, before jumping into Satoshi's closet full time about 15 months ago. Okay. So we really accelerated and I, maybe I would say pivoted into the direction that we are uh, mm -hmm. building toward uh, a year ago mm -hmm. with the launch of our first app, which is an application called Gallery which we designed as a multi-chain NFT gallery for serious collectors and artists. But we pivoted to that product to being an interactive NFT display for physical venues and live events. So we're already in these spaces. Last week during NFT NYC, we, we supported nine different events in a four-day span with our interactive NFT display kiosk. Out of that product, we're evolving point of sale capabilities that when combined with our mobile wallet are going to create this seamless NFT commerce in these physical spaces. So ultimately, mm -hmm. our view is to enable that entire full stack NFT commerce solution at sporting events, at concerts, art galleries and retail to help build this decentralized economy. I mean, a lot of it looks like commerce and it is commerce but under the hood and i think this is true for a lot of crypto projects it's really about decentralizing financial and personal interaction between people not having to have intermediaries whether it's a streaming media platform um a ticketing giant to enable more fluid commerce between individuals for currency and culture through our applications how how does this story end for your company in a perfect world? That's a great question. And it's something that I, I grapple with because the space that we're working in is so much bigger than we are. <laughs> um, you know, this, this is a world that's being created and what we can do is help bend the arc of that future into a direction that is true to the ethos of decentralization, self-sovereignty, and free economic exchange between people. So where we ultimately fit into that, bending that arc, um, it kind of remains to be seen, honestly. It's such an innovative space. You see companies beginning in a traditional startup mold that have visions to decentralize their own governance to create a DAO-based model of governance, DAO being decentralized autonomous organization. Right. Fancy oh, way of oh, saying oh. that your, your community or your market participants help govern the entity. So if we really fulfill our potential, we, we sort of outlive our own individual utility within the project because it's grown to have a life of its own. What an interesting answer, and you are a very interesting founder. Michael Pasco is the head of Satoshi's Closet. He's been here on the Accelerator with Michael Conniff. Remember uh, to follow us on Twitter at Michael Conniff. Go to my website, michaelconniff.com, C-O-N-N-I-F-F, -F, and subscribe uh, and give us a nice ranking on uh, your favorite podcast platform. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure, and, uh, and of course, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Michael. Happy to participate.
And uh, thanks for listening to The Accelerator. And we'll be back with another podcast before you know it.